Well, good morning, church. As some of you are pretty frustrated that you're just starting to get into worship time and all of a sudden somebody interrupts it. So uh, good news, uh, your team's coming back and you'll enjoy that more later. I am honored to get to come back. I have been here before when you're meeting in your other facility. First time to speak in this room. But, but I love this church and how you are uh, learning increasingly how the body of Christ is uh, made to work together. Uh, you're experiencing that here in Chico, crossing uh, church boundaries, denominational lines, working together with other fellowships throughout this city for the good of your community, and increasingly uh, is working through the denominational lines of the family that <laughs> this church is part of. By the way, if you type in Chico Alliance Church into your phone, it's 10 hours and 15 minutes away. It's up in Bremerton, Washington, so it's... A <laughs> right. Right, so, uh, no, no, it's good, it's good. So here's the word that I want to bring to you this morning. Let me just dive right in. Uh, Acts chapter 1, starting with verse 6. The disciples are asking Jesus a question, and it's at a very poignant moment in time because this is their last shot to ask a question, at least of the on earth, face-to-face, -face, risen Christ. They've spent three years with him. They've had that horrible weekend where he has been crucified to their huge dismay and, and grief. He's uh, stunned them all by rising from the dead. Not all of them fully believe. There's still a measure of doubt as they're grappling with grief. It's hard to, in, in a stage of grief, it's hard to receive truth. Sometimes it's hard to have a clear perspective. The woman that was in the elevator this morning as I came down, and she was uh, uh, from the Oxford Hotel where you guys put us up, came down and I uh, said, morning, doing okay? And she said, another day, three months here. You know, living in the hotel, obviously a victim of a fire. In, 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 this, in, a, in a moment of grief, it's hard to keep his perspective, but I, I want to announce to this region while I'm here this weekend something that many of you already know, but, but it's the simple fact that grief is the appropriate response to loss. It's wrong when we try to over-spiritualize pain, loss, suffering, and just say, well, you know, God's, you know, good, and God's alive, and God, well, oh, that's true. Oh, well, God is good. God's alive. God's active. God's going to do a great thing through this story. He's going to do a fabulous, he is doing a fabulous thing through this story, but when in the middle of grief, <laughs> as I'm in my wheelchair 10 years ago today with a feeding, feeding tube hanging out my stomach, weighing 140 pounds because something has eaten 50 pounds of my muscle mass in a few weeks' time, and now my wife is my nurse and caregiver, as I've lost a job, uh, athletic ability, um, and a ton of things in a few weeks' time as I've lost all of that. I'm in a place of grief. And others are coming and telling me, God's writing a good story through this. It's true, he is, but it's sometimes hard to receive that because grief can blind us to the bigger story. But give people time. Give them the grace, give them the space to allow grief to do its good work because when we grieve well, <laughs> it enlarges our soul. When we grieve well, it enlarges our soul. When we grieve poorly, we just become more shallow, bitter, ugly, narrow, snippy kind of people. <laughs> Ever met those? <laughs> but, but, when we, but when we grieve well, it enlarges our soul because it takes us to deeper places where the Spirit can work, where we're, we're allowing Him to access different avenues and, and caverns of our heart. So grieving well enlarges the soul. Part of grieving well is learning to forgive, learning to trust, learning to receive help from others. I hated getting help. <laughs> I wanted to be the helper. I didn't want to be the helpee. I don't want to be in the receiving end. But So the disciples, Acts chapter 1, they're in a place of grief. Uh, they have been. Some of them have, have better perspective than others. But I don't shame them or blame them when they ask a question that's got three mistakes in it. <laughs> Jesus is so gentle. He's so kind. He receives our questions. He's happy for us to ask questions. It's okay to ask questions. In fact, 
when I wrote a book that asked a lot of questions uh, from my own soul, two of them actually, and a publisher wanted to turn because I did receive a miracle uh, healing after 18 months of not eating a bite of food or drinking a drop of water. Um, and God healed me through my wife's prayer and touch. One moment I went from not eating in a year and a half to being able to drink orange juice, eat, eat a cup of yogurt, drink a Wendy's Frosty, and have a bowl of chili before the night was over. So it was a pretty good healing. <laughs> but, but in the midst of it, I was asking lots of questions, and afterwards I wrote a book called An Honest Look at a Mysterious Journey. The publisher that wanted the book um, wanted to turn it into just a happy miracle story, swallowed by joy. Oh, it gagged me. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I needed a book that wrestled with hard questions and because a question is a quest, a pursuit. And Jesus wants to be pursued. And if you've got questions today about the whys and how longs and what's going on of life, that's okay. It's all right. And, and your question might not even be a good one, as theirs wasn't. I'm going to show you in a second. Three mistakes they made in their question. Your question might not even be a good one, but if it's leading you to pursue the Christ, then keep asking and keep pursuing. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. God said to people who had just been hauled away by the Babylonians to exile hundreds of miles away from home, you will seek me and find me when you... Seek me with all your heart, and part of that search is question asking. And so, what's the question? I don't know if you're Bible uh, flippers, readers, whatever, uh, but I uh, hope you got access to one. Acts chapter 1, the question that they ask him, he's risen from the dead, he's meeting with them, and they say to him, Lord, that was the one thing they got right in the question, Lord, <laughs> Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Let me just gently point out three mistakes. Uh, first one is, and Jesus answered, uh, it's not for you to know the times or dates that the Father has set by his own authority. Number one mistake, when we ask the when, the when question, we're probably not going to get an answer. At least not very often. We're not strong enough to know the future. God's strong enough to know the future. God's wise enough to know the future. If we knew the future, it would destroy our today. <laughs> We'd make a total mess of today if we knew our tomorrow. And so he just says, today's sufficient. <laughs> You're only big enough for today. In fact, you're really not big enough for that. You need me for every moment, but one day at a time, friends, one day at a time. So, so the when question, when are you going to do your thing, Lord? And he looks at them kindly and he says, it's not for you to know the times or dates. That's under the Father's authority. That's under his authority. Here's a principle I learned in my illness and recovery. My Jesus, our Jesus, can do anything at any time for anybody. Do you agree? He can do anything at any time for anybody. Our Christ is not limited by anything. Time, uh, space, circumstances, economy, um, presidential elections. Our, president, our, our king's not hindered or restricted by anything, but... He often waits for a very specific moment for when he does what he does so that you know that he was the one doing it. Why, Jesus can do anything at any time for anybody, but his sovereignty is often expressed through timing, which is totally irritating because it requires us to be in a place of waiting. And none of us likes to wait. How long, O oh Lord, the prophet and the psalmist cry. How long, O oh Lord? It's a historic human question. When, 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 when? And his answer is, that's in the Father's category. You get, we get to learn trust. We get to learn lots of things in that waiting stage. Mistake number one, they asked the when question. Mistake number two, Lord... <clears throat> Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Lord, what are you going to do? And the second mistake is the who question. Now, again, it's okay to ask these things, but 
What is Jesus, how does Jesus gently correct them in this mistake? What's the mistake? Lord, what are you going to do? How many people are shouting that at heaven? <laughs> and his gentle answer is, actually, <laughs> you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the earth. Ah, they ask one you question at him, and he has three yous coming right back. <laughs> You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you've got a job to do in this. Lord, what are you going to do? Actually, the question is, my disciples, what are you going to do? <laughs> because God is faithful, and it's always at work in this world. Will you agree with me on that? He is always at work in this world. There is never a moment in time, there is never a circumstance, there is never a situation where my God is not active. Mysterious? Yes. <laughs> but active always. And he looks at his disciples as they're pointing the finger to him, Lord, when are you going to do your stuff? And he says, actually, what I'm going to do is empower you by my spirit, amen, to do the work that I've called you to do. So you have an assignment. Those of you who came out for the leadership event last night, that was joyful. Thank you. Uh, it was fun to spend that evening together. And we talked about how we are in full partnership with the king of the universe for the most significant thing on the planet, the taking of the love and message of Jesus to our neighbors and to the nations and to the nations that are coming to our neighborhoods, that we have this divine partnership, this relationship with the king of kings and lord of lords who says, I want you to join me in what I do in this world. And it's here, uh, Chico, that I just have to do a timeout and say, neighborhood, bless you, bless you for the way that in the last few years, whether it was the Orville Dam situation or the campfire situation or other stories that I don't know about in this community, you are practically seeking to be the hands and feet of Christ, the body of Christ to this community and this region bless you for that. You're in partnership with the heart of God who loves every person who's been impacted, who longs for his life to be revealed to them. Thank you for the many ways that you have served. I, it's, it's one of the, I, I've felt badly that it's taken me this many weeks to get here after the most recent crisis, various circumstances for that. Uh, but I wanted to stand here, look you in the eye and say, way to go, church. Way to rise to the moment where you will open your facilities and open your hearts and open your wallets and open your homes and open your whatever. Uh, stories that I don't know of being the hands and feet of Christ in this community. Could we always do more? S certainly. There's always another day to do well, Not always another day, but, but there's today to do more. But at this moment, I just have to say thank you. So they made a few mistakes in this question asking. They want to know, Lord, are you at this time? The timing question. Lord, what are you going to do? And do you notice the third mistake that they made? Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? What's the mistake there? Well, they had forgotten verses like uh, Isaiah 49 that says, it's too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and the people of Israel I've kept for myself. I'm going to make you a light for the Gentiles. That there was a bigger story being written than just about them. They, they were looking forward to how they were going to be benefited by this, uh, you know, expression of our Christ. But he says to them, actually, the story is a lot bigger than that. You're going to be my witnesses right where you are, Jerusalem. Start right where you are, Chico, or whatever town you're from. Start right where you are, but don't get stuck there. <laughs> this is a problem in American Christianity. There's always so many issues right in our own community that we care so much about our Jerusalem, and we should. You should weep over your city. You should celebrate over your city. You should be passionate for your city, but you shouldn't just be focused on your city because the commission is bigger than that. It, it, 
The heart of Christ is big enough within you. The Spirit of God that has been given to you is big enough for you to care not just about your town, but about the rival sports team as well. Uh, Judea. It says, you'll be my witnesses in your town, Jerusalem, and Judea. That'd be the surrounding area. And uh, here's where paradise would be part of the conversation right at this moment. That would be your Judea. Thank you for investing. You'll be my witnesses, my life testimonies. You're going to live out my message in your town, in your region, and Samaria. What's Samaria? People who live close to us who are not like us. People who live close to us who are not like us. Now, maybe 50 years ago in Chico, I don't know, I wasn't here, but maybe 50 years ago in Chico, you'd have to go all the way to Sacramento to find a Samaria. But I'm guessing the times have changed even here. That all across America and all across the world, frankly, there is this fascinating intermixing of humanity in probably unprecedented manners where this huge people on the move thing is happening in our world. And so um, I'm going to show you pictures in a few minutes. And when I say Spanish ministry in Germany, and when I say Arabic ministry in Germany, that's Samaria all over the world, this mixing of people coming together. People who live close to you are not like you. And we're to be as witnesses all the way to the farthest reaches of the globe. Uh, let me do a quick math lesson for the four people in the room that like math, okay? Um, if you want to find a follower of Jesus here in the United States and you're willing to knock on doors, if you're bold enough to do that, and you knocked on a door every 15 minutes, it would vary statistically from uh, throughout our nation. But on average, you could find a follower of Jesus within an hour and a half if you knocked on a door every 15 minutes in the United States. Let me take you to Europe. If you want to find a follower of Jesus in modern-day Europe, whether it's France or wherever, you knock on a door every 15 minutes for eight hours a day, and in a day and a half, you could find a follower of Christ. Quite the difference. But I need to, warn, I need to let this church know that there are still places in the world that do not have access to this message, this access to this gospel, the ends of the earth kinds of places that were in Jesus' heart. You'll be my witnesses right where you are, Jerusalem, Judea, surrounding area, Samaria, people who live close to you are not like you, and all the way to the ends of the earth because it's his heart that there will be representatives in heaven from every tribe and tongue and language and people that he wants everyone before the throne, every people group represented before the throne. And so today I need to let you know that if you want to find a follower of Christ, in places such as some sections of the former Soviet Union, in some sections of North Africa, and some sections of the Middle East, you'd have to knock on a door every 15 minutes for eight hours a day, for 365 days a year, no vacation, no time off, for two and a half years before you'd find your first follower of Christ. Start today, and sometime late in 2021, you'd find your very first believer in Jesus. And then if you want to find your second one, you'd have to knock for two and a half more years. Because in those lands, this gospel is forbidden, it's outlawed, it's feared, it's rejected in a variety of ways. But our commission isn't to just go where it's easy <laughs> or comfortable our commission is to go to the ends of the earth. Let me show you. Let me take you on a tour. Let me, let, let's, let's get this into a photo form. Uh, uh, my story that I'm going to share in the next 17 minutes starts right here in North America with our founder, Dr. A.B. Simpson, a pastor who got frustrated because his church wouldn't allow new immigrants into his congregation. 1881, it was an issue then as well. He resigned uh, because they wouldn't allow new immigrants into his congregation. Those were Italian immigrants, by the way. And uh, he started taking the gospel out. This was a gospel carriage who traveled all the way from New York to Boston to carrying the message of Jesus. His Jerusalem was New York City. 
right there in New York City, 1881. They, they, he, he had a heart for the world. And oddly enough, the first thing that the unemployed pastor did was start a magazine. Uh, if you wanted to find out about missions in the 1880s, how do you know about what God's doing in the world? Well, he launched a missionary magazine that still exists today as the Alliance Life, an award-winning magazine, actually, and we're happy to send you a free subscription if you'd like. He also started a local church, which exists today as Johnny's Pizzeria. <laughs> really good pizza place in New York City, but it's no longer a church. But through that one church, there's now 2,000 Alliance churches throughout the United States, including three deaf churches congregations, ASL congregations, and together those 2,000 churches have in the last 10 years baptized, no, that's just Ohio State Stadium, we could care less about that, well, that we have baptized together 122,000 people as a, as a family in this last decade. The other thing that he started was a missionary training institute. If you wanted to be a missionary in the late 1800s, there wasn't a lot of opportunities for training, but uh, he launched the Missionary Training Institute, which exists today in the form of four colleges, really, Simpson being one of them in, in our region here. And the very first graduates that, uh, from the Missionary Training Institute were sent to Africa, specifically to the country of Congo, where John Condit, at age 20, led the team and died within two weeks. The team got discouraged. Only one of them remained. Yet from that very sad and difficult beginning, I announced to you that in the Democratic Republic of Congo alone, there's over a million followers of Jesus worshiping Christ today in the Alliance churches that grew from that very difficult soil. And throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, there's 2.3 million followers of Jesus celebrating today as we speak. Guinea is one of those countries. I was just there 10 days ago or, or two weeks ago. Guinea is a um, country where the Ebola crisis hit with such a fury. We, are, we have been there to not only help stop Ebola, but also to give condolences to those who have suffered loss. We grieve with those who grieve. Some of you know this place well, the Gabon uh, Gabongolo Hospital in Gabon that ministers to uh, 3,000 people have come to faith in Christ the last two years in the Bongalo Hospital as every patient and family member receives a gospel message. Burkina Faso is one of the poorest planets, uh, 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 countries on the planet where our team has helped to establish clean water on local church sites so that Muslim neighbors can come to the local Christian church to get clean water. Um, widows that come to faith in Jesus have been cast off by families, uh, but we've come alongside them to provide the support and the food. There's a section of Burkina Faso that has resisted the gospel for decades. Year after year, we prayed and tried to get uh, uh, national teams or churches or missionaries into there that never were allowed until just the last few years something broke in the spiritual world. And for 40 churches, 40 churches have now been established as national leaders and missionaries have worked side by side to bring the gospel to to that formerly resistant region. Mali, across the border, Sahara Desert, a difficult place, a high infant mortality rate. So we started a women and children's hospital, Kuchala Hospital, that now has celebrated its 10th anniversary, having ministered to 100,000 patients, delivered 20,000 babies, and conducted a whole bunch of surgeries. And if you look real closely at that photo, that 10-year-old child was the first baby that was born at the Bangalore Hospital. Recently, uh, we, and so we not only mourn with those who mourn, we, we rejoice with those who rejoice. The Church of Cote d'Ivoire, formerly Ivory Coast, is actually larger than the U.S. Alliance Church, and 6,000 women used, recently came to a women's gathering, took an offering of $3,000 to send to persecuted Christians in the Middle East <laughs> out of their poverty. Let's jump over to Asia Pacific uh, in um, the 
early turn uh, early 1900s robert jaffrey walked away from a family fortune his family owned new newspaper chains throughout canada and walked away to establish work that we now have in places we'd call indonesia and, and china elsewhere even as the great depression threatened to curtail our work jaffrey with his pioneer spirit said do you ask in view of the terrible economic depression of today Dare we go forward in these new fields and commence new work? Yea, rather may we ask this. <laughs> Dare we, in the face of the command of the Lord Jesus, and in the face of the encouraging miracles he's working on our behalf, Dare we hesitate for one moment. And so we move forward to places like Vietnam, where during the Tet Offensive, uh, we had the sadness of losing seven of our missionaries to martyrdom. Yet today, the Vietnamese Alliance, your sister churches in Vietnam are over a million believers strong. 60,000 people came to faith last year alone through the Vietnam churches. And the communists had confiscated our seminary and its property gave us back more recently one-tenth of the property we once had. So if you can't build wide, build tall. And that's our... Uh, seminary training up the next generation of kingdom service servants and are uh, building a 2,500 seat auditorium so that one person can come to a church conference from every church <laughs> because they can't rent a community theater, uh, civic center, or a football stadium. Philippines, it was university students living in outlying areas that asked our missionaries to come to the capital city and plant a church, which they did. That church alone, Capital City Alliance Church in Manila, Philippines, has been used by God to plant 35 other churches throughout that city, including this one in a squatter's village that just had a fire rip through the village and hundreds of families are now displaced and homeless at that church that I'm standing in front of a year ago. Philippines, uh, some of you heard me share a story last night of uh, speaking at this event. Uh, this is the auditorium, just to give you a visual of that. But this, these are their missionaries that the Filipino Christian Missionary Alliance are sending often to countries that you and I with an American passport can't get into. Jumping over to the gorgeous country of Indonesia, where this, uh, where there's numerous unreached people groups still, but this local pastor partnered with our missionary moved into a region that had never received the gospel before. He couldn't just plant a church, but he could start a coffee shop, especially because he liked to do coffee through that rather unique means of animals involved in the processing of the coffee. And through that the method of coffee making, coffee shop, coffee distribution, a church has been planted. And people have been come to faith in Christ in a beautiful way. One of the greatest works of God right now in, on the planet is happening in Cambodia as this uh, country known for violence and oppression and evil rule has now opened its heart to the gospel of Christ in an unprecedented way. Many church groups, CMA with other groups working together to get a church plant in every village and city of Cambodia in the, in, in the next few years. Baptisms, Bible translation projects, church planning in previously completely unevangelized areas. Paul said, I long to preach the gospel where Christ is not yet known, so I wouldn't be building on anybody else's foundation. Well, our team is doing that right now in Cambodia, Laos. And we don't hear about it much anymore, but the Andrianoffs were our first missionaries to go to the Hmong people. It was a witch doctor who was the first to respond and come to faith in Christ. He actually helped them translate the Bible into Hmong. And today there are literally hundreds of thousands of Hmong believers. And this is one Hmong teenage youth conference that I spoke at here in the United States in, uh, in Illinois. Japan, in spite of Jaffrey's insistence that we move forward, the one place that we didn't listen to him was in Japan, and during the recession, we withdrew our missionaries. But 
One of our missionaries, Mabel Francis, respectfully resigned and stayed and was there to welcome us back after the Depression and at age 80-something received the highest civilian award that could be honored by the Japanese government for a lifetime of faithful service. Yet today, less than one-half of 1% 1 of Japanese follow Christ except this young university student literally found a Bible in a Tokyo gutter, found an Alliance church because it was close to his favorite pizza place, <laughs> and found Jesus in that church and today is studying for ministry. Jumping continents again, we're going over to Middle East where it was the Bradens that first brought the gospel. George would travel by camel from Beirut to Amman to Jerusalem, got arrested numerous times. But today, Jesus is the light of the world, that sign says, on top of our church in Baghdad, <laughs> where Pastor Joseph, survivor of a car bomb, walked out unscathed while his car burned. Sixty people last year uh, then in 2018, we're baptized at the Baghdad Alliance Church. Jordan, you know something about this country. Uh, first of all, Mafrak, a 50-person church was praying, how do we reach more people for Christ when the Syrian civil war breaks out and thousands of refugees spill into their town, and so they receive the homeless they receive the broken. They listen to all the grief stories. They start a school for the Syrian refugee children. And today that church has had huge impact in that region for Christ. Alliance Academy as uh, another expression that uh, Chico has been part of. Thank you for that. I was there a couple, of, uh, I don't know when I was there. <laughs> but uh, the beautiful thing is that the school is going forward and families with Children with disabilities in the Muslim context have almost no help or hope, but our Christian school is there ministering to them, and it's a beautiful thing. The church in Amman has its own community center reaching out to refugees that have spilled into their country. It's beautiful to watch. More close to home, Latin America. We're flying through. we got to keep moving. Uh, it was through the river routes that we first brought the gospel to our Portuguese and Spanish-speaking neighbors to the south, including the Peruvians, uh, the 300 churches strong, sending out 60 of their own missionaries. Chinese work in Peru. No ministry is complete without a ping-pong table, of course. And... The Peruvian president, my peer, Mario Perez, came to my office in Colorado Springs, gave me a gift of this Chosky, the original long-distance runners that would take the message of the king to the people. He gave me that gift, not knowing I'd been an ultra-marathon runner, so it's especially meaningful to me, but he gave me that gift saying it was the alliance that first brought the gospel to our people. Thank you. We challenge you to continue to be a herald of the gospel to the world. Join us in Dominican, if you like, where we have 60 churches, including a beautiful church plant in Punta Cana. Did you know you've got sister churches in Cuba? During the decades when America was not welcome, the Chilean and Canadian alliance was in Cuba planning the church. And if you don't have rhythm before you get there, you're going to have it by the time the Time you get home, believe me. My peer, president of the Cuban Christian Missionary Alliance, Yoel, will be speaking at our council this year, Visa and Lord Willing, a former Marxist, atheist, communist, who has a powerful conversion story of how God met him, had to borrow his sister's Bible for a year as he became a pastor because it took him a whole year to get his own Bible in Castro, Cuba. And... Today, there's over 400,000 brothers and sisters, 3,700 in some form of theological training, education, studying for ministry. Quickly to Europe. Some people think the church in Europe is dead. We would beg to differ. Baptisms in Italy, in Germany, multiple expressions of the church. As I said, Spanish uh, work in Germany, moving into towns that have almost no access to the gospel, and Syrian refugees, as you know, moving, have moved into Berlin and were there uh, with the gospel. 
If you're uh, young or young at heart and want to come to Paris for a while, join our Envision Center. We can mobilize you and your native English skills uh, and the local church, uh, international churches, baptisms taking place, and I just got to keep on flying. This military fighter in Kosovo got frustrated that the newfound independence was being used by Muslim extremist fighters to recruit terrorists. And so this former Muslim fighter went to find a Christian pastor, had to travel a couple hundred kilometers to find a pastor, brought him back, and now together we're seeing a new expression of the church in a place where it has never existed. And it's a, it's a unique local expression biblical and beautiful. I just need to move on here. North Central Asia, Russia, when the communists, uh, when the Soviet Union fell, our president, Dr. Rambo, sent our missionaries in waves to Russia. And as a result, today we partner with nearly 100 churches in Mongolia. You think it's cold here this morning? <laughs> There were only six known believers in all of Mongolia 30 years ago, but today we have 30 churches that have been planted. And some of you are aware that there's regions I can't name by name for fear that you might put on social media or the Internet, but in places that we give code words to, like Tea House or Long Beach, there's an advancement of the gospel where it's never taken place before and is really not legal, but the Word of God going forward. And like the author of Hebrews 11, if you know your Bible, I don't have time to tell of Angola, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, El Salvador, Ghana, Great Britain, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, India, Israel, Kenya, Lebanon, Mexico, Myanmar, Nepal, Niger, Panama, or in Portugal, South Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, Venezuela, more than a dozen countries I can't name, or Fiji, Finland, New Zealand, Australia, and let's sing it together, oh, Canada. <laughs> All together, the Alliance family that you're part of now numbers 6.3 million strong, 180 dialects, 22,000 churches. All that started from a pastor who got frustrated about immigrants not being allowed into his church. Two things as I close. One is this. Chico, <laughs> you're part of a family that is trying to take X18 seriously. Be his witnesses right where you are, in your region, in your Samaria, and all the way to the ends of the earth. You're part of this family. I'm not asking you to join something new. This, all, this, this is the family. These are your stories. This is your family. These are your family stories. You do get to clap and celebrate for that because you're clapping for your own family stories. And then the second thing that I want to say is, for some of you, you haven't engaged yet individually. As a church, you are. But individually, some of you have never thought about giving to the Great Commission Fund or praying for these kind of things or maybe considering going yourself. And I'm not shaming you at all for your focus on Jerusalem and Judea. I'm celebrating that today. But I'm saying his commission is big, and he's calling us all the way to the ends of the earth. And it would be really impossible for you as a local church to do that effectively as an individual church. But as you bind together with your district, thank you for hosting Encounter in just a week or two, the district event. And as you bind together with the other churches throughout the USCMA, together we really are seeing the witness of Jesus going to the ends of the earth. And so those words of our Christ are being fulfilled through us. Join us in that. Andrew. Thanks for this time, brother.